Representative Melissa Hortman, thank you for being with us today. You'll be leading the DFL caucus as the minority leader. Why did you decide to seek the position of minority leader? Well, our fearless leader, Paul Thiessen, who's been the leader of the Democrats for six years, uh, decided it was time for somebody else to have a turn. We would have been really happy to keep him as long as he wanted to keep doing the job. But it's a very exhausting job to take care of all the members of a caucus, whether there are 72, which was our, our high water mark under um, Paul, or 57, what we have now. So um, when he decided to step aside and, um, and another really strong leader in our caucus, Aaron Murphy, opted not to make a run for it, then I decided to make a run. What makes you a good fit? Well, I think what's uh, really important right now is that I come from a district where I have to win votes of both Republicans and Democrats. And the path for us back to the majority is in some pretty tough districts where we need to get all the Democrats to vote for, for our team, but also some of the Republicans and the independents in the district to vote for us too. So I think that it's um, the values that we stand for as the DFL our values, we can certainly get a lot of uh, independence and Republican votes, but we have to talk to people in a way that respects their difference of opinion and know that they're not going to be with us on everything. A minority leader at times is viewed as a pit bull, a pot stir, or more kindly, the loyal voice of opposition. Would you agree with that characterization? I think the loyal opposition is the description I like the best. Um, if we were to just be against whatever Republicans are for, I think that would not be giving the uh, voters or Minnesotans what they deserve in terms of leadership. I think that the job of the minority is to find those places where we can work on common ground and work together to get things done. I think where there are areas where we believe the Republican approach falls short for Minnesotans, it's important that we point that out and we hold them to the highest possible standards of delivering for Minnesotans. Whenever we can, we will be on the team and delivering good results for Minnesotans. And how would you describe your relationship with House Speaker Kurt Dowd and House Majority Leader Joyce Pepin? Very cordial, very professional. I like both of them personally. I think in this business, um, in recent years, maybe the media has focused a little bit too much on the, the politics of personality. And I really don't care whether the speaker and the governor like each other as people. They can communicate in writing. This is a job where we don't have to like each other to work together. But I do have a very good social relationship with both of them. Republicans will hold both the House and the Senate for the next two years. How do you plan on working with them? We'll focus on those areas where we have common ground. You know, when people decide they're going to run for the Minnesota House of Representatives or the Minnesota Senate, they usually say to themselves, I want to make Minnesota better. So we all have that in common. And like I explained to the freshmen at their freshman orientation, we're also those people who are ridiculously patriotic. All of us, our favorite holiday is the 4th of July, and we get teary-eyed when the flag goes by. So we have to first respect the fact that we're all in this because we want to make people's lives better. And we just have different ways that we think we can accomplish that. But I think if we focus on where we have commonality, then we can get things done. I'm hoping we'll be able to improve college affordability. I think it's become very difficult for middle class kids to go to college in Minnesota and not graduate with really t way too much debt. And I think that too many families who have two parents working have a hard time finding high quality, affordable childcare and early childhood education opportunities. So I hope we can work together to make things more affordable for families. Negotiation is key to getting things done around here. How will you approach the table when tough issues are before you? I think the most important thing that we can do here in Minnesota government is go back to basics and use the structure as it has been constructed. In recent years, we've seen three guys go up to the governor's mansion and have conversations behind closed doors. That is not how it is supposed to work. We have committees where we hear bills and we amend bills. When we pass them off the House floor and the Senate bill, when they're different, they go to conference committees, which should meet in public. What's really important is to use these processes. We have 201 legislators who represent all the citizens of the state of Minnesota. There's no reason to have three top leaders try to do the work of 201 legislators and to try to do that work in 10 days or three days or four days at the end of session when we can use the entire session to do it. So we'll be pushing for the rules to be followed and the process to be followed so that things are as transparent and open and clear as they can be to Minnesota citizens. So talk should be done in the open. Absolutely. Do you have a role model? 
Uh, you know, I was raised um, Catholic, and my mom was my Girl Scout leader. So I guess when I think of my role models, I think of my parents. And my dad is fond of saying, always treat people the way you want to be treated, the golden rule, and really going to church and hearing the homilies and saying the prayers every week for my whole childhood. I, I think that if you treat people how you want to be treated, that's the best way to conduct yourself. And my mom is my Girl Scout leader, and she was a PTA president when I was in elementary school, is always looking for a way to leave things better than how you found them. What is your caucus's top priorities for the 2017 session? Working families, improving lives for working families and Minnesotans in Minnesota. So where it is that we can improve people's lives, we want to improve people's lives. And like I talked about before, two of those key areas are college affordability and child care affordability. But other things are economic development. You know, some parts of the state are subject to the boom and bust cycle of the commodities market. And we have to be uh, very deliberate about coming up with some economic development opportunities for our rural areas that are right now too dependent on the world commodity market. Do you expect these priorities to be addressed? I do. I think that those are areas that Republicans also feel strongly about. I'm not sure, you know, whether we're going to find a partnership on college affordability and child care affordability. I think some of our Republican colleagues believe that families should be on their own with that. And I will work to, to persuade them that it will improve Minnesotans' lives if we make college more affordable and if we make child care more affordable. Are there areas where you see opportunity for bipartisan cooperation? I think on a transportation bill, I think there's a lot of shared desire to do more road and bridge construction. Um, there's not as much of a shared desire to do transit, but we have to think about the fact that um, in Nicollet County, uh, grandmas who don't drive still need to get to the doctor's office and so transit is really not a metro versus rural issue or a suburban versus a greater Minnesota issue. Transit is really a statewide issue. So I think if we can come together on a transportation bill that would be something that would be great for us to accomplish this year. Traditionally odd number of year sessions such as 2017 focus on creating the state's two-year budget. Should Minnesotans expect any other major issues to be resolved? Well, since the um, previous leaders failed to get a bonding bill done last year, and there's a billion dollars of construction that's ready to go, I think we should expect that the state's leaders will get a bonding bill done this year. It's kind of like um, on your house. There's certain things you can't just leave. If you don't repair your broken windows one year and your uh, aging roof another year, eventually you'll get to the point where you have so much maintenance on that house that you have to do that you can't afford to do it all. And the state is really similar. What we fund in the bonding bill are things that last 20 to 30 years. And if we don't build uh, buildings at the University of Minnesota to accommodate new technologies, if we don't build major bridges, we fall behind on these important state investments that really power our economy. And right now we're behind. And so I think it's very important that we get that bonding bill done and get that out this year as well. You're the mother of two college-age students. You've been a big backer of helping decrease college student debt load and at the other end of the spectrum, a proponent of increasing early childhood education funding to make it more affordable for all. Will either of these happen in 2017? I think that Minnesotans should expect we make progress on both of those issues. We're a state that has very high labor force participation. A lot of Minnesotans work. And when we go to work, what we want to do is save money so that our kids can afford to go to college and we can maybe help them out a little bit. And we want to be able to have our kids in a place when we're at work where we know they're very well cared for and that we're not um, spending all the money that we're making on childcare. And as a working mommy, I know how hard that balance is and, and how important that issue is for parents and their productivity in the workplace. So I'm hopeful. A constant issue we talked about a little bit here, transportation. What will you push for in 2017 to help fund road and bridge projects across the state? I think the key is dedicated long-term funding because if we put $400 million in one year, that sounds like a lot of money. But we have to understand that we have a two-year budget for transportation right now. It's $4 billion. And if we don't think about in terms of percentages of increase of funding and over what time period, then uh, we can't really put into context these kind of multi-million dollar expenditures that we're making. So what we have to look at is how much money are we committing over a period of time? Are we talking about a one-year shot in the arm 
or are we talking about consistently getting to a higher level of construction and maintenance? The thing that with roads that's a little tricky is we don't just put them there and then not have to take care of them. They have to be repaved, they have to be restriped, they have to be plowed. And so it would be wrong to just use debt to build this kind of infrastructure. We have to have ongoing maintenance. And the bigger the network gets, the more money we have to pay to maintain it. So we can't just do some borrowing, do some big projects, but not increase the budget to take care of that infrastructure. And do you think a compromise can be reached with Republicans in this issue? I absolutely do. We did it in 2008, uh, you know, after the bridge collapsed um, in August of 2007 and 13 Minnesotans lost their lives. We were able to get a supermajority and override a recalcitrant governor's veto to get every single fracture critical bridge in the state fixed so that would never happen again. I think both Republicans and Democrats know how important this issue is to Minnesotans. So I think that we should be able to find common ground. We should be able to get it done. Let's pretend today is May 23rd, the day after that session must constitutionally be done. Looking in your crystal ball, what would you say your message will be to Minnesotans at that time? Well, they can count the legislative session as success if we maintain the budget responsibility that we have right now where we have structural balance. Our expenditures into the future and our revenues into the future are in line with each other and we're not giving too much in increased spending or too much in decreased taxes that in the future we're, we're setting the state up for a deficit. So that will be one measure of success. And another measure of success will be, did we improve the lives for working families in Minnesota? Is it easier to send your kid to college? Is it easier to find high quality, affordable daycare? These are things where I think Minnesotans should look and say, we had a budget surplus, they had six months to work on it, am I better off? And they should be able to say yes.